Welcome to The Road Home with Jamil Giovanni. On this first episode of the Roan Home podcast, we're going to begin with some background on where the podcast is coming from. I wrote a book called Why Young Men, Rage, Race, and the Crisis of Identity. It was published in Canada for the first time in April 2018 and will be published in other countries in 2019. When the book came out, I initially planned to do a normal book tour, right? You go around from city to city, you talk to local media, you meet with people who buy books. And I was unfortunately kind of hit with an, one of life's uppercuts. Um, a few weeks before the book came out, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. And so the book tour that we had imagined dissolved overnight. Over the course of getting better uh, with my cancer and going through chemotherapy and radiation, I had a lot of time to sit back and think about what I would do differently. If I got a second chance to do a book tour, what would that look like? And with additional months to plan, what came to mind for me and the team I'm lucky to work with is to do something less conventional. So instead of going from city to city and speaking with people who buy books, which disproportionately is an older audience, people who are higher educated, formally speaking, and to have a lot of excess income and time, We wanted to instead take the book to people who might not have heard of it otherwise or might not have bought it or read it otherwise, to people on the ground, uh, at the grassroots level, who are doing work to help young men who grew up like I did. The book explores a number of themes that are not just important to my personal life, but also to my professional life. It looks at family breakdown and economic disadvantage, and immigrant and newcomer experiences. It looks at resentment and ideologies that promote hate and the use of the internet to spread propaganda. It also looks at the role of good role models and positive influences in saving young people from the depths of despair and negativity. So we decided with this opportunity to do book tour 2.0 that we would go meet people who have some important things to say about those issues who spend their time and energy trying to save themselves and others from suffering and disadvantage and from some of life's traps which far too many of us wind up being caught in the podcast starts off as a an account of those conversations from Vancouver to Halifax, from the Pacific to the Atlantic coast of Canada. We talked to some really interesting and inspiring people and we didn't want to keep those conversations to ourselves. We think that they are important and that there is an audience out there for what I regard as real and honest conversation. Most people seem to be fed up with the way our politics and our culture tackle serious issues. And I think there's a hunger out there for insights that are based in reality and practice and the lives of everyday people, as opposed to hearing from the, you know, chattering classes that make up the panels on our radio stations and our television programs, the people who dominate on social media often, the people who you know, take up space virtually everywhere an important conversation tries to take place. So this podcast is designed to provide real conversation outside the confines of political correctness, self-censorship, whatever we think we should be saying, whatever we think other people want to hear, and instead just try to have real conversations about what life is really like and what it takes to make for a better country. This podcast starts off with a prominent focus on Canada because that's my home country and that's where the book tour 
that inspired the podcast took place. But the themes we touch on are relevant to anyone in the English-speaking world who cares about young people and cares about families and social mobility and progress and improvement and a better world. And I think that probably describes everybody in some way. The first guest on this podcast is the man whose challenge to me inspired this effort. We met shortly before I was diagnosed with cancer, and I thought our relationship would mostly just be, he's a relatively famous guy who is going to write me a nice quote from my book, and that would be it. But instead, he was there with me in the hospital. And he checked on my mom when I wasn't doing well. And he welcomed my family and my younger sisters into his house when we needed a a place to go to escape what was the most difficult period of my life. So it's fitting then that not only do we start with him for personal reasons and what he's meant to me and his mentorship and his guidance, but also because many of the people who you will hear on future episodes have also been inspired by him. Michael Pinball Clemens came to Canada as a young man in his early 20s from Florida. He was drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs and left the NFL to join the Canadian Football League, where he became the most successful running back in CFL history and has grown into so much more than just an athlete. He took his success and prominence as an athlete, became a coach, became an executive, but to wider society became, very importantly, a philanthropist. He has generated millions of dollars of donations for projects across Canada, the United States, and East Africa. He has built schools. He has funded youth homeless shelters. He has worked with young people in the child welfare system. It's not an exaggeration to say that he has touched the lives of millions of people in a broad range of ways. And he also exemplifies, I think, the spirit of this podcast, which is to say that we are not having conversations with the assumption that there is some magic power that will come from government or from the sky somewhere and save us, that those who are suffering and disadvantaged among us do not need a hero to emerge from the abyss, but rather through our own decision-making by building strong communities, learning how to support one another, we can change the world. And I think that pinball is a walking example of that. You will hear from him the kind of mind state that it takes to be a leader and to immerse yourself in the struggles of young people and still wake up the next day with the hope and optimism required to make a difference. Every day. He's a unique man who I think has a unique story to tell. I'm very grateful for the chance to have included him on this first episode. And I think you will see that the example this conversation sets will connect with future episodes where we will get a diverse range of perspectives on how we move our country forward and, by extension, the world. Without further delay, I bring you Michael Pinball Clemens. It's not often a person gets the chance to interview uh, one of their heroes and somebody who has made a real difference in their life. So So I take... Am I interviewing (laughs) you? No. Uh, But I'm really uh, glad that I'm going to have the opportunity to... uh, to chat with you, especially since you are the brain behind the road home and not just our engagement with cities and young people across Canada, but also the uh, you know, podcast and the video series that we're creating as well. What's the problem that we're trying to solve with this effort? When we say problem we're trying to solve, um, it might suggest that youth, young people living in the margins are problems. In many ways, that's why the problem has not been solved. 
is because we don't see them as assets, as that we don't feel that they're fundamentally uh, important to the proliferation of our culture and our society. They have so much talent, so much ability, are so dynamic uh, uh, that if we understood and properly invested into those assets, um, our, our communities would be infinitely better. I came up with this concept, The Road Home, uh, because you specifically inspired me. Uh, your story, your desire to let people know, right, that you failed the literary test in grade 10. When you graduate from Yale Law School, right, you know, many times people won't share that kind of information, right? But your love of community, your inspiration is so deep, it's so vast. Your story needs to be told. Young people need to hear it. And not just in marginalized communities, but every community. But we, I guess we can't do it all at once, so this is how we start, right? And as we tell your story, there's something about home. When I think of road home, for me, um, I have this sort of, um, magical sort of thing around hope and that hope for me derived um, with a, a single parent mother who prioritized education right and she really um, gave me the ability to navigate what is a what could have been a very difficult life. And life for me uh, has not been difficult at all. I cannot complain one iota. And it is that hope that, that um, when I met you, that's the kind of hope that I saw, that, that yes, it is possible, that, that, that this is tangible. And my mom was the first person of color to work for the city of Dunedin. That's in where the Blue Jays train in Florida. And so, so she was the first person of color to work in an administrative position and really prioritized education. This was really important. And so as I see that, it kind of connects me sort of to this whole other web and Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad and, and the country I now call home in Canada uh, and being a Canadian citizen and, and that magical idea of this, this brilliant young man who um, who pulled himself up right um, uh, alongside of the person he didn't want to disappoint that's the same as me that was my mom we both didn't want to disappoint our moms that was my greatest fear in life is disappointing my mom and neither one of us wanted to disappoint our, our, our moms and, and while I came from this heritage that is the US and, and the struggle right it was Canada that we made it to and Canada is where you grew up in but then you actually felt some of that struggle that very same struggle in Canada here but there was enough there right there was enough in Canada to grab hold of, right? There was Humber College who gave you a hand and then there was uh, a York University that gave you a hand and then um, Yale University Law School. That's extraordinary. Do you actually think about that sometimes? <laughs> that is extraordinary. This story needs to be told. But what is more urgent is those who are struggling today, who are the Jamils of today. And this program will not only tell a story, right? Uh, it will also provide the foundation of how we best help those Jamils of today. So the road home is Jamil traveling from coast to coast, telling his story unbelievable story, inspiring youth. But as much as anything, we as adults, as responsible adult allies, understanding how to best support the Jamils of today. What have you learned in your work as a mentor, as a community leader, as, a, as an athletic role model, as a coach, as an executive? Um, that makes you believe there's something we can accomplish in helping that process move forward? Well, the human spirit is the world's greatest superhero. So there, without hesitation or reservation, even without, you know, so me, me being involved in anything, like, you are that guy, right? Um, the system didn't necessarily accommodate you, right? But you did it. 
It happened, right? And so that is possible. What we want to do is develop a higher level of consistency. We don't want you to be the exception. We want you to be the rule. And that is why we're doing this program to support youth in, in, in the way they should be su supported. This is, we're not doing anything um, that traditionally we haven't talked about. You, we often hear um, in Caribbean backgrounds that it takes a village to raise a child and, and it truly does and right now um, uh, I don't think everyone who is engaged in the village right is taking on the responsibility right and so I, I think if we owned it and we we all supported youth right youth would be fine and they would be doing achieving great things and and we wouldn't have uh, the the numbers that we look at when we look at children who are in foster care they move to five different homes during the course of their youth when we look at um, students of color uh, especially male students in the greater Toronto area, if we can speak to that specifically, and the statistics are probably similar right across the country, but 40% of uh, black males don't graduate high school, right? That, that's unconscious, like, like what, what's next when that happens? And, and so uh, what, what we're fundamentally uh, trying to do is um, look at the best practices in, in, in what works and what I've seen work are wraparound supports. Things that, well, if, if there is no dad in the home, right, that, that there are other supports that are there that help to pick up, the help, that actually help mom to make sure uh, that they can get along in, in, high, in, in, in school, right, that they can get on with, along with their academic activities, that they can also have access to sports and to arts and to other things that they might not readily ha have access to, uh, that they can move on then uh, to see and believe that they can uh, have uh, the kind of life that they desire, that they can go on and not only graduate from high school, but finish some level of post-secondary training, right? This is the most effective things. When I look at programs uh, that, that uh, manifest that, uh, there's a program called Empower we've been working with since they came from New York City. We were, were, um, uh, they, they were one of the first persons that they came to uh, when they came here, because some when gave them our name and and this program is phenomenal 500 young people will go through this program uh, this year all from marginalized communities the average household income in those communities is thirty two thousand dollars the they average starting at after a 16-week program that includes some resiliency in the workplace training as as well as an actual certification sometimes it's a cisco certifications other certifications they get but they're averaging thirty nine thousand dollars the average is the range is between thirty five and fifty thousand dollars so they're doubling their household income as they start, sometimes as teenagers, most of the time as early 20s. And, and so they're doubling their household income already. This is not an experiment. In, in this case. This is not something we're trying to do to elevate you to another level. This is what is that transformation that, that takes someone from the margins to mainstream and gives them a trajectory to do so much more in their life as they're getting an opportunity as well to, to work with some of the largest and brightest companies in the country. So when you were drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs and when you were playing for the Toronto Argonauts and you were building your career and your livelihood as a professional athlete, did you think that you would be starting a foundation that is creating programs to help kids facing the kind of challenges you did growing up. Was that always on the radar? Was that always a possibility, that way of giving back? So I never thought that I have my own foundation, right? Because I, I thought that that was uh, self-praise, right? I, I didn't want my name on anything. And so, but, but charity absolutely was. I mean, we uh, would do literally uh, when with the Argonauts here, I would, I would do 75 different 
things a year out, out in the community and doing charity. And, uh, and that only increased over time, right? And, and, but what I found is uh, at some point that I, I really need to focus my energy a little bit more. Once I was married and I had kids and, you know, it, you know coming, you know, from an event at, you know, one o'clock in the morning twice a week, uh, yeah, just just didn't work with having a balanced lifestyle, mm -hmm. and, and so with that we tried to um, uh, really try to center our work, and we still work with Easter Seals and and Special Olympics, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters. Uh, we still work with several groups outside of our foundation because our foundation isn't the answer. The Love is actually the answer. Caring about one another is the answer. So our foundation is not supposed to answer all the questions, right? And it can't answer all the questions. So, so we still do a lot of things outside of our foundation, but we developed a, a, a foundation because we want it to uh, mature, right? And so as we mature, right? So, so as a young person, especially as a boy, right? Is that trouble with choosing between what is good and what is bad, right? Just trying to, you know, we always walk in that line. But as we mature, we shouldn't be choosing between what is good and what is bad, but between what is good and what is best. And so for us, um, what we decided, my, my bride and I, is we decided to, to build the foundation because we, we wanted to try to invest our time in not just doing good things, but trying to do the best things. And the best things, we believe, is working on behalf of those who are most marginalized in our community. Wow. One of the things that makes you special and the work of the foundation special is that you have an ability to connect with both a young person who needs uh, a hand, who needs a program that's going to help him or her uh, get through school and get a job, but you also have the ability to connect with the person who might write a check that makes that program possible. Right? You can speak to both audiences in a way that is rare and unique. What do people who can only reach one of those audiences who might know what the kids are going through but might not know what the people who organize the programs are thinking. Or the people who know what the programs look like but don't know what the kids are going through. What do they need to better understand each other? Well, what, what I would say is that, that that's, that's a big, it's, it's a better process, right? For me, speaking to both sides, right, stretches me. Right. We, we, you want to make sure that as you develop an organization that you have trustworthy people around you. Right? You, you've, you've never seen the biggest corporation in the world, the biggest corporation at a company, the biggest organization in a province. Right. Have one person. Right. Effective organizations accrue people and they accrue trustworthy people. So it is actually a beautiful thing. It is a benefit. Right. To have someone who is really specialized in one area and complement him with someone who is specialized in the other area. It makes more sense. Right. And so as we look at that for the person who is the one who's on the ground. Right. And and is doing the work. Right. Right. Well, the most important thing is tracking your success, being able to identify real success, real progress, like the numbers we talked about. When you have a program that takes 500 young people through it who have an average household income of 32000 and they begin as teenagers or early 20s doubling that household income at $39,000, that program attracts money. It attracts an audience. It attracts people to it. People want to support those kinds of things. And if you have to go out and recruit, right, whoever that is, it may be you. It may be Jamil Javon. Jamil needs to tell this story for me, right? So if you're the guy that's on the ground and you're doing a program that, that, that's effective, right, it, be purposeful, be effective, be good at what you do, right? So if you are the guy on the ground who's doing the work, right, be great at the work, right? And, and They'll, they'll be, you'll find opportunities to tell that story to people, right, who will either be able to write the check or will find you people who can write the check. If you are writing the check, be re 
I, I just petition you to, to, to be a little bit more. You can write a check and do to whatever you want. But if you're saying that I'm trying to help a specific problem, like those who are most impoverished, right? When you say that, just can't live it, right? You want to do what you say. You want to find the programs that are doing not just good work, but the best work. And, and, uh, but there's, there's nothing wrong with not having one or the other. That's what building a team is all about. Building a team is finding those things. It's not finding someone who's just like you, right? It's not somebody who can have a successful program just like you. It's actually someone who fills in that portion that you can't do. And, and that's what the world is all about. None of us or any good alone. That's why the harshest point, form of punishment in our society is solitary confinement. Because if you're alone long enough, you go crazy, right? This is not about solo, right? This is a we thing. One of the moments that stands out where I've seen you in action is uh, at, a, at a meeting where we were planning a community event. And people kept talking about kids. They kept saying, oh, we're going to get the kids to show up. We're going to do this for the kids. We're going to help the kids here, help the kids there. And you changed the course of the conversation when you reminded everyone, which kids are we trying to help? And, that, and you remind everyone it's important to be specific. Because if we're trying to help the kids who need it the most, who need our support the most, they might be harder to reach than just kind of kids generally. Uh, why is it important that we understand that difference? And what have you learned about what it's like to focus on those who are most in need? Well, it's, it's a constant process, I can find myself in the middle of the other conversation from time to time. And I think it, it really is discipline. Um, there's a saying, we all must suffer one of two pains in life, either the pain of discipline or the pain of regret, right? And when we like when we lack discipline, even when we're doing good things, right, it could yield unproductive or even negative results. And so it really is just being careful to understand that while we're here in effort to do something good, right, um, let's understand exactly what our purpose is and exactly where we're going because if we're not careful, right, we have all of this wisdom around the table, all of this talent, all of this goodwill around the table, and it can easily go awry if we lose our focus, right? That is, that's one of those things that we speak to in sport all the time is focus, 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 right? And, and managing a game as, as a head coach is much like that, right? As you got all of these different things and you, you always have to think what's next, what's next, what's next, right? And, and uh, with that, I, I think if we uh, collectively um, uh, exercise just a little greater discipline in that area. Um, a real challenge is that we're using other people's money. Right? And um, when we do that, sometimes we can become complacent, right? And it should be the exact opposite, right? So, so as the person who's the donor, right? We, we want to, to say to the donor, whether you're donating money, time, whatever, right? We, we want to use your time, your money, your resources, whatever you're giving us in the most effective way, right? For others as, as we reach out. And, and so if we, can, if we can keep some of those little things in mind as, as we come uh, to the table and we have ideas, because I, I mean, it's, there, Good ideas, right, uh, often come out of right, seemingly unfruitful conversations, right? And we can get sort of cast in a way and going away. So it, it really is about focusing on um, the issues and, and trying to deal. It's so hard to deal with everything, right? Yeah. If, and so if we, it, because everything is overwhelming and everything is not a topic, right? It's not a subject, right? It's, it's everything. Right. And so when I get and I get we, we, what do we got to do? Oh, oh, we got to do everything. Right. How, how, how do you how do you do everything? Right. What does that mean? And so as as we get in and we can dissect issues. Right. And be purposeful and intentional about specific issues and and really learn uh, best practices in specific areas. Right. It, it, it actually helps to de-stress our situation and make us more effective. I think anybody who's hearing you speak, 
uh, in this conversation or any other one would leave with the sense of this is a very optimistic and positive guy, right? And they might not, it's, it's, it's hard to find that quality always in people who like you have their minds and their hearts with the people suffering the most. You know, I know where you spend your time. I know who you think about. I know what's, what's on your mind when, when things are quiet and you're by yourself. And it's people who have a really difficult life. How do you not give in to the urge to be pessimistic and cynical? And how do you not give in to the temptation to be resentful, but instead, as you put it, discipline yourself to be hopeful uh, in the face of a lot of evidence that might break someone's hopefulness? Uh, practical uh, decision. It, it really is a practical decision. Uh, if, you, if you go from just how I feel, the emotional, it can be overwhelming. Absolutely, there's no question about it. Uh, but they have this four-step process uh, in psychology that I first uh, learned uh, when I read a book called The Complaint-Free World. Right? And it says that we complain right, on a regular basis not realizing it. And that's called unconscious incompetence, right? It says, but at some point we become aware of it. Like we, we hear our own self-talk. Somebody tells, why do you complain so much? Or it, so we, we become aware. And so when we become aware, we move from unconscious incompetence, right, to conscious incompetence. And nobody wants to be consciously incompetent, so that's where you try to change the behavior, right? And if you're successful at the behavior, right, you become consciously competent. But if you can develop consistency at that, it doesn't stop there. If you're consistently consciously competent, it actually becomes a part of who you are, and that's unconscious competence. And so it, it, it can be a learned process. If I, if I think about it in a, a, a much simpler way is this. If, if I'm having a challenging day, I don't feel great every day when I wake up, right? And if, if I don't feel great, right, um, I can make the decision early on as I get started that it's going to be a miserable day. And if it is, it's going to be more miserable than if I would have made the other. See, even if I made the decision to make the best of this day, regardless of how I feel, right, then the day is gonna be better than it would have been, right? And, and so the, sim the simplicity here then, if I know that and I understand that, right, then if I am negative, I'm making the choice to hurt myself. If I consciously understand that, Right. That same process that we talked before about the unconscious. I, I can walk through that process. Right. And understand that I'm not doing the best for me. Right. And 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 at some point that can also become a part of who I am in, in that respect, too. I can walk that same bridge and get to that same conclusion that if I'm positive, at least the day would, would be better than it would have been. I also tell my girls this. Right. That neutral is negative. Right. Because they would say, well, dad, I didn't do anything. I say, that's exactly what you did wrong. Right. You didn't do anything. Uh, can you imagine a day if we walked around and, um, you know, no one did. I mean, take, take somebody did, did nothing wrong. Right. They, they, they got to work on time. They, they had all of their assignments completed. Right. Um, uh, they went to lunch at the right time. They didn't take an extra minute. They got back on time and they left for, for, for work on time and, and got home on time. They did everything right. Right. But in that process, they never said hello when they got on the elevator. Never said hello to the person who mined the desk at the front, right? They never said thank you or had any kind of input for any project, right? It, that, that would be miserable. That's apathy. Neutrality is apathy. For me, it's positive or nothing, right? And so when we walk around and we have this idea, well, I didn't do anything wrong, I'm not, you, you know, when we become a part of community, right? the better we become at it, we, we, we make community more intimate, 
we, we do little things, not just give to charity, but we speak to people. We say hi. We ask them how they're doing. We get to know people's name. We, we become, uh, when, when, when we become more intimate in community, we, we don't know what people are dealing with. And I think, you know, as we look at mental health and the different things we challenged with today, I think many of us are becoming so insular. Right. And so I don't you know, want to act like I'm a mental health e expert, but I, I do know that it's positive or nothing because even neutral is negative. Yeah. I see the road home as a way to channel a lot of your energy and your spirit and, and see where else it exists in our country, because we know there are people who are fighting the good fight elsewhere. And I think this is an opportunity to spotlight those people and spotlight their efforts. But we want to do more than just talk. There's an impact we have by having the conversations and telling the stories, but we want to take that somewhere. Where does that go? Well, the optimal place uh, that this goes is because when we say we, we do have champions, right? There's no question. We got champions right across the country, right? But what we don't realize is how many people want to be champions. How many people want to join the movement. They just don't know where to start, right? They don't know what to do. And so this movement, as we move like physically across the country, right, is more of a, a transition in mindset, right? Where people, where we can help to uh, have uh, learnings, have conversations, uh, uh, intersect with people who are doing things effectively in many different ways, at many different levels, in many different communities, right? And, and begin to bring some best practices in, uh, together in a way uh, that we've never seen before, to actually have conversations about stuff that we don't know and we don't understand with people who have experience, who, who have will and have desire, and, and become better at solving this question. We say that young people right, are the most important people in our culture, right? Um, but we don't act like it, right? If, if that were the case, more of what we see on TV, right, would be material that is what's best for young people. Uh, more, that, more that happened in our communities, the emphasis in our communities would all be based on young people. Yes, we do have uh, programs in many communities and, and uh, there are some uh, communities that are thriving and can, can say that today. Uh, but um, I think it was um, uh, uh, Marcus Garvey who said, how can I be comfortable with, that, at, with what I have as I see my brother struggle? And uh, it is, I think, that tireless pursuit of um, uh, hope, dignity, and opportunity uh, for those uh, young people who are most marginalized, that is our goal, that is the finish line. Uh, being able to um, have working solutions, not a solution, but working solutions, because they will be multiple, right? Uh, working solutions to answer that question is ultimately what our not only desire is, but our commitment is. And so we're committed to this and we will find solutions. We feel we'll find answers. They won't be fast enough because there's 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 no way to be fast enough. We we need all of those things today. Um, but going through the process is important. Uh, it is imperative. Um, uh, it's the only way we can get there. And um, as we do it, I think um, we will we will also um, see what is Canadiana, right? Uh, Canadians um, do embrace um, the world and, uh, and is, I, I believe, um, most driven, or most highly driven uh, by those in their own community. Uh, Canadians want to see Canadians succeed. I truly believe that. And as we begin to find those solutions, I think we will find that we will have more champions. There are heroes in our midst, some that we don't know.
Thank you to Pinball for joining us on episode one of The Road Home. For more about Pinball and his foundation, you can visit pinballfoundation.ca and follow him on Twitter at Pinball. And thank you for listening.